we are supposed to be talking about the relevance of music journalism in the 21st century. <clears throat> I own an independent record label called Razor and Tie, and I've spent the last 10 years trying to uh, explain to people why I might be relevant still in the new music world. Uh, so I'm going to turn to these three gentlemen and ask them, in the 21st century in 2015, is music journalism still relevant? Who would like to start? Stuart, hmm. why don't you start? Hello. Um, I think so, but you have to make it relevant. That No one has a right to be relevant in this world, whoever you are, I think. I think journalists in every area have just got to... There's so much noise, so much digital noise, so many different ways of discovering music, that if you're not, if you're not being valuable, if you're not making some, an important point, if you're not being great, then why should someone treat you as a, as a, a person worth listening to? So it's kind of a fun wake-up call, I think. No one, no one can expect to be a tastemaker. You have to do valuable stuff and, and justify yourself. Do you, you have to do valuable stuff in addition to being a music journalist? <laughs> Something that contributes to society. Well, I think, you know, I mean, I think in, when I was young, I used to go and buy the NME every week, and I would, it would be my playlist, and all the people there were my experts, and they'd tell me what thing. Now, I can find that from all manner of sources, and when journalism cuts through, it's because someone's written an amazing review or an amazing interview and it cuts through because it's good, not because that's the only source anymore. So I think the quality has to be pretty good. Yeah, but I think, I think Stuart brings up a good point in that the amount of noise that exists in the world, especially within music, it's, it's unbearably difficult to discover or contextualize music because of the amount of music that's being made as well as the amount of opinions that are out there. So, you know, music journalism and music criticism and just general coverage, I think having a point of view and having an opinion is very important, and I think people need <clears throat> things that they can trust, that they can look to for any number of things, guidance, discovery, contextualization, whatever. But point being is that if you don't have an opinion, then I think the, like, you know, even the younger generation, they, you, you don't matter much. If you don't have an opinion, it's just available and it's free and it's digestible and then <clears throat> it's gone. Yeah. I think one of the other things that's changed a lot is control. You know, so one of the founding myths of sort of the, you know, the, the internet was you're going to do away with all these traditional gatekeepers. All the big radio stations and TV companies and magazines and newspapers are all going to disappear and it's power to the people. And unfortunately, that's really just been replaced with a bunch of algorithms and a load of noise, which is why, you know, we've got this sort of, we need people to guide us more than ever. And yet it's more difficult to do that because everything has become so fragmented. So I think, you know, that... That's the case is it's needed more than ever, but it's more difficult to cut through the clutter. Yeah, that's right. Well, the, the gatekeeper point is an important one, but the two of you both said something about quality sort of rising above, but isn't the structure and the, and the model, the way things work today, make it very, very difficult to rise above no matter how good it is? I mean, 20 or 30 years ago when people were really relying on M NME or Rolling Stone or whatever it was, a review in those publications was really one of the only sources that people might be able to refer to. Now you're competing in this entire world, and if a artist tweets something about an album that they like, that could be more meaningful than everything that, that you're all doing on and some you get, level. You get the journalists kind of writing Twitter reacts to this album, or right. when the Beyonce album came out, and all the journalists were sort of doing a first listen review, because they got it when everyone got right. it. And you sort of see, we were trying to catch up with stuff that's already out there. But then I think, I mean, a lot of this noise, like on social networks, where a lot of people get a lot of their stuff from Twitter and Facebook. You now they get their news from it, they get their things. But what cuts through is still being written by someone somewhere often. So mm. for example, Adele did a Rolling Stone interview the other day. It was a long piece and a good piece, I thought. And loads of my friends were sharing it, and that's how I found it. I didn't find it by going to Rolling Stone and seeing what's happening. I got it because people were sharing it, saying this is a really good piece. So in a way, you don't, you don't start with, I'm going to go to this place. You often start with, someone I respect has said this is good and I'm going to go and check it out. And that right. can be music as well well, as, as journalism. There's two parts though, aren't there? What you're talking about is adding the narrative, adding the story around it. Mm. And I think that bit remains really valuable because mm. that's a scarce commodity. The ability to tell a story well is still something which requires skill and experience and practice. Mm. But discovering someone, pushing someone through, that can be anyone. It can be, just like you say, a tweet from somebody with a bunch of followers. It can be a 30-year you know, 30 30 experience music journalist hack. As long as that somebody says, "Here, have a listen to this," you serve the same purpose. I think they're the, you know, it's almost like we've got two different sets of what music journalism is doing: telling the story and breaking the music. Is is it is is cert, are certain genres more susceptible to being meaning to having music journalism be meaningful? Is it uh, you know, in terms of 
kind of more traditional writing and critical assessment of music? Is it easier to be influential in indie music versus R&B music versus pop versus rap? I mean, I think that, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that, I don't know that it's genre specifically, but I feel like the contextualization of the larger end of the artist scale, you know, the Adele's of the world, I think for people in the amount of music that they're digesting, if you are interested in, the, in kind of the, the skinniest part of the long tail, you need that context and something to latch onto. And I think that those stories are only being told through music, you know, music journalists. So if you want to know about Adele, she's not out there tweeting, she's not completely open with her life, she's not, and, and rightly so, but you need to be able to look to someone that can dig deeper and contextualize that. But I don't think beyond the discovery side of it on the other end and figuring out you know, who that person you can trust is or who, that, who the conduit for your discovery might be, uh, that's maybe not as journalism might be putting it in too broad of terms, but what that is doing is, is in some ways validating and in some ways you don't want to be on an island by yourself just finding something or seeing an artist tweet about something. You want to know that you're around people and especially because no one, there's so much out there that you can't be your own. You, you're, you need to have a group. And I feel like that validation, while it's not being spoken about, it's helped, create, it's helped maintaining your individuality via having journalistic opinions versus just mass Twitter social media opinion. Mm -hmm. And it's weird, I mean, journal, I mean, what you call journalism is happening in a lot of different places now, I think. So right. I got into a bit of a Twitter row once when I wrote a story about Apple hiring journalists to do editorial within Apple Music. And Spotify have journalists doing editorial. And this guy who was a tech journalist was quite snippy at me going, um, are we calling this editorial now? I call it marketing, don't you? And he was very cross with me for saying this was journalism happening within a digital service. And yet, I think a lot of the things that I would usually get, used to get from the enemy, the kind of, here's the songs to listen to, here's the artists to listen to, that's also happening within Spotify by people who would have been a journalist 10 years ago, which makes it kind of fun for, if you're a Guardian or a Pitchfork, well, what are you doing? You have to do something good to make it worth coming to you. And I think that's why people love Pitchfork. I think it's why people come to The Guardian, hopefully. So you don't make a distinction necessarily between editorial opinionated uh, material within a music service versus something that appears in a more independent uh, publication or outlet? I think it means you have to focus more on opinion and analysis and giving a shit about stuff. Because the stuff that's happening is, here's a new band you might like. I mean, Matt's presentation now was saying, Spotify can do that through algorithms and through humans working there. So as a journalist, you can't just be the person saying, here's some new music. And that's why some of my favorite pieces have come in the last two or three years, where people have just upped their game. They've got to do something meaningful. Yeah, I, mean, I, think. I, think, I mean, I know we have a, a couple people that used to work for Pitchfork that are in Wenton Apple Music now. And I think beyond like, the written word and the articles and the, and the longer form content, I do know how much care that they are putting into the, kind of, the, the storytelling of music. So if you need a primer on a specific band or scene or genre, I mean, it's absolutely being thought through by some of the smartest musical minds that I've been privy to know. And maybe that's not journalism anymore, but at the same time... That's being done, again, I'm sorry, it, in the, like, in the within music Within the context service. of Apple Music and saying, hey, you know, you've never heard of Who's Could Do, here's your, here's your breakdown. So it's, in some ways, it's surface level and it's spoon feeding, but it's not algorithmic, in, in which case, to me, it always goes back to trust for me. So it's, I trust that Apple Music is, if I like that playlist, you know, I'm going to maybe want to know, because I might just be of that person, that whether it be as a human or a computer that built it. And I would also like that component of journalism where I could go read more and dig deeper and find out things. And that's where the, the additional journalistic side comes from. But for me, you know, trusting a person or a service is a similar mentality. And I think it's an important one, because trust is paramount. And that's how the noise is cut through. I Can you be? I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. I think there's, a, there's another sort of challenge that music journalists are facing, <coughs> which is, the artists are so much closer to the fans now. So fans know so much more about their artists. <clears throat> they see them on Tumblr, on Twitter, on Vine, wherever else. And so a lot of that story that music journalists used to tell, well, a lot of that, lot of that the artists are telling themselves. So it's a, I think it's a, you know, and sort of just echoing what's already been said, it's a case of you have to up your game. You have to work out what is it that I'm going to add? What is it that I'm going to do that hasn't already been done? And maybe, you know, the story, you know, a piece about Adele, well, okay, Adele's a bit different because she doesn't share that much. So it's easier to do that sort of piece about Adele than, you know, most other artists. Yeah. What, what about the uh, fact that people are discovering some music today more via singles versus albums? Does that present new challenges for journalists in the sense that people just want to hear one song, can access that, access that song as opposed to relying on a journalist to sort of explain an artist or an album to them? I mean, I think from our perspective, singles are an important part of music because they're you know, of the moment, there's something timely, newsworthy about it, but we are very much kind of stewards and, and, and lovers of the album, so the entire picture. 
and I think it's, uh, it's not always reflected by the audience, which is why as a journalistic entity you want to be covering both things. But yeah, I mean, the album, is, the album is real, and I think that it's actually reverted away from that single mentality again. I think people are taking time and making records. Like Adele's not just putting out a single. She could, but she wants to make and create a story. And I think that it's honestly part of, you know, of, of what we're getting at here, which is that, that narrative and that bringing in your game to the next level, um, honestly, in some ways, means I need to make a good record, not just a good song. Well, I think the future of the album does pose really big problems. So it's always going to be there as a creative construct. An artist is always going to want to put an album out. A label's always going to want to build albums. It's much easier to make money out of albums than it is out of singles. That's but, true. You know, <laughs> but we're in a situation where m more and more people aren't listening to full albums. So Adele is not a typical artist. She's an album artist. Yeah. In a lot of ways, she's like an artist from 10 years ago. So, but the good news for music journalists is the music aficionados, you know, the people who really, really spend a lot of time with music and finding out about artists and go to see and play live, they like albums. It's the more mainstream consumers are the ones who are listening to playlists and singles, and they're not really the ones who read music journalism much anyway. But it's well, kind of funny. I, mean, I, I interviewed um, Steve Angelo on stage yesterday, and he's on stage later, and he was talking about his new album. There's going to be a batch of tracks, then some video stuff, then a virtual reality experience, then some more tracks over the course of a few months. And so that whole thing of like the definitive review of his new album, much harder because it's, it's like a package of things. Right. right. And but that's how people, that's in response to how he thinks people want to get the music. So for journalists, you have that thing of, well, how do I cover this? Do I, do I review the new tracks? Do I then review the real thing? Or it, it's kind of funny that the, the form of journalism is going to adapt, I think, according to the format of the music. Right. Isn't it getting also more specific, in other words, I, I, that there are still meaningful journalistic outlets, and I'm using journalistic outlets in a very broad sense, for specific genres, if you're a hip hop person, there's a bunch of people who you talk to. And for rock, there's a bunch, but they're really smaller communities talking to each other as opposed to what may have been more of a mass thing in the past. And you kind of have to super serve that smaller, dedicated community. I mean, that's reflective of the idea of trust again. And I don't mean to belabor it, but it's if you love Kanye West, there's there's a couple websites that you can go and read about Kanye West all day long by the people that know the most about Kanye West because that's all they do and want to talk about. And I think that's an important component to music, but at the same time, you know, any astute music listener, which is the majority of the world at this point, you know, whether it's casual or otherwise, if it's playlist, you want to find out those additional layers. So I feel like you know, uh, the, the specified genre sites and the specified fan sites, they provide a piece to the puzzle. And if you only need a few pieces anymore. That's really the, the difference, is that there's so much that having, there's, it's so overwhelming to have too many options that you just need a couple. And that's, it's, the, it's the narrowing down. And that's where you know, it, it kind of has to balance itself out. You just uh, sold part or all of your company to Condé Nast. Is there, a, uh, is there a viable business model for a music publication, as we would use that term broadly, to remain independent and be financially successful, or do you have to be part of a larger company at this point? I mean, there's a, it's a bit of both. We wanted to be a part of a larger company because our independence at the time was limiting our growth, but at the same time, Condé Nast remains an independent company at a totally different scale, and we were able to become a part of them in full and all of the different areas in which we want to be growing or expanding or kind of deepening our coverage, it's reflective of the way they've approached their brands. I mean, the New Yorker exists, and it, it, maybe they're, maybe they're covering across culture and, and everything else, but for us, music is foundational part of people's lives. It's, it's intrinsic to your soul, it's romantic, it's never going away, it's omnipresent across the world, so how it's covered and how it's discussed is hugely important to us, and I think you need uh, a brand behind that, and a brand, and we don't have to be the only brand, but a brand that's out there covering it and that people can look to. And that, for Connie Nass, and I don't mean to continue on here, but you know, they, they see that in their other brands, and that's kind of the reason we did it, because it can't just be money and growing and building apps. It had to be something that's specific to our own vision. What do you think, Stuart? Well, it's kind of, I think, for independent journalists, it's a really interesting time because you can do all kinds of different things. So you can, there's blogs like Drowned in Sound or Pop Justice in the UK, where they struggle to make money from the web element but Pop Justice is doing a radio show for Spotify and he gets paid for that. There's things like Patreon coming through that journalists can use to fund their work about something like. And there's stuff like, um, I used to work in the games industry and there's a big thing about can games magazines, they're all closing down, is there a viable model for games journalism? Meanwhile, on YouTube, this whole new crop of people were, pl were playing and talking about games and becoming incredibly rich and influential. So I think as an individual who's just interested in and passionate about some, a subject like music, it can seem daunting, but there's loads of people want People want that passion, and someone will 
pay you to do it in a way that's interesting, but it might not necessarily be the traditional magazine that you had gone to 10 years ago when you wanted to go to the enemy and that was it. Yeah, I think there's a linking theme between that and some of what we spoke about before, which is the idea of what is defined as journalism and what isn't, and whether it's in a music service, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's on YouTube. I think ultimately, you know, the, the story just needs to go where the audience is. And it used to be contained within a nice, clear magazine, a nice, clear website, and the fact that, you know, you got that Adele uh, story shared, and the fact that the PewDiePie has huge audiences on YouTube, and the fact that a Twitter, you know, a single tweet can break an artist. It's okay to be successful. If you are going to try to be one of the tastemakers, you've got to work out every single place that you're going to tell your story. It doesn't mean you're going to do all of them, but you've got to understand the value of each of them and not say, I'm just going to write my 500 words. Yeah, you have to be everywhere for sure. I mean, being where listeners are, they're not always going to come to you anymore. So they, you need to be present, and, and quality of presence is valuable. I mean, we run music festivals that have, that's not journalistic at, at, at all, but at the right. same time, they're reflective of our point of view, our ideology, what we want to do in, in our own terms. And, Again, it, it goes to the audience looks at that and says, I know what this means and I know I understand what this might stand for. It's not, again, for everyone, but for our world, it's important. But we have, we have to, as a business, as well as just thinking about the way music works, to be everywhere else and not be intrusive in someone's life. You need to be, you need to be helping at this point. Is data a threat to music journalism? I mean, I don't personally believe that it really is. I think that there's, I think it's an important tool that can be used, but it's not ever, it's always going to be complementary, I hope, uh, with regards to human, human discovery, human interest, human involvement, but the data that you can support it and the ways in which you can manipulate and distribute, it's fascinating and it, the most exciting time to be a music fan is right now because it's, everything is out there and there's no right answers anymore and you can figure this all out for yourself however you'd like and, you know, to Stuart's point and to Mark's point, it's like, you've got all these different options and these tools available to you that you can find and pick and choose and when, when that all starts narrowing down, Ideally, yours are still left standing. But the data can be the story sometimes yeah. as well. So look at all of the, the buzz at the moment around Adele. And everybody's talking about how many Vivo streams she's got, how many downloads she's had, what her airplay is. The data is actually the story there. Yeah. You know, yeah especially with the streaming. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. Well, well, I guess, I mean, I, I, the other thing is, uh, there was a period of time a few years ago when I think everyone got hung up on Google and SEO, and it was like, writing about this will get more traffic than writing about that. And it was hard to, to make sure. Whereas now with the social stuff, I think it may be coming back a little bit in that if you write something original and meaningful, it gets shared. Like there was a piece recently in the New Statesman about Terence Trent Darby, who was massive in the UK in the 80s and disappeared. And this journalist went and found him and said, what's been happening? And it was a great story. And it was all over Twitter and all over Facebook because it was original. Uh -huh. And so in a way, you would have written a, a story about Britney Spears doing something if you wanted traffic. And that was a story for the love. But it's getting an audience now beyond its publication. So. Right. Okay, the clock is ticking down. Three, two, <laughs> one. We're out of here. Okay, thank you very much, thank everyone. You. Thank you, guys. <laughs>